the real problem is not in religious ideologue, because that's only about maybe 5 to 10 percent of any population in any time. Uh, the, the real problem is, is economics. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, let's, let's say this, let's draw a modern comparison. Uh, in in pre-civil rights America, uh, in an African-American town or, or a job, they, your, your wages were probably a third to half as much, and you were denied uh, lending at banks, and you couldn't travel, you were restricted to go to certain areas, and there was always a sense of like, uh, the man was going to get you, you know, like kind of like a state-sponsored terrorism against people who were black. Exactly. What's going on in Palestine is not very different. <clears throat> the average wealth uh, or average income of a, 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 a citizen of Jerusalem, an Israeli, is about 18000 a year, uh, whereas a Palestinian working right alongside an Israeli is making about three to 4000 a year. So, And, and there's... Uh, reduce access to credit at banks, there's reduced housing, and special license plates, special driver's licenses. And you're, you're segregated as far as what areas you can go. So it is very much, uh, you know, if if we call, started calling the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you know, the new apartheid, or, you know, like... Jimmy Carter Bain, he got a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> yeah, or, or we called it the Jim Crow era of Israel, you know, then we'd have a different lens, but because we put religion into it, it really blurs things. But it is about economics. When you when you don't have jobs, or if you have a lack of access to um, family, housing, you know, basic needs of life, people get mad, and especially young young uh, young men with mm -hmm. no jobs. It drives them to the mosque. Yeah, and sometimes and where there's extremists there. And there's there. that five to ten percent of extremists, uh, both. Um, among Israelis and uh, Muslims are there preaching, unfortunately, you know, destruction. And uh, we've got to have a new way, a new diplomatic way to solve this, this solution or get to a solution. What is it, what's your take on, um, you know, uh, the way forward for, for national diplomacy between the country, you know? Well, when you were discussing the whole, you know, you know, five to ten percent of these extremists. Well, like you were mentioning earlier, Bush's refusal to meet with envoys. Our behavior doesn't exactly encourage the moderates. So I think an important part of any diplomacy campaign is you have to encourage and support the base of these moderates. I, I would love to see our next president, you know, lead a movement. I always think about if Al Gore had been the president uh, and we had started going in another direction besides oil, uh, what what our our government, what our economy would look like. Would we have three dollar a gallon gas? Would we would we be in Iraq? You know, so I think the next president's going to have to take a pretty strong stand and say, you know, we need to go in a new direction because our energy it's it's like we're, our energy needs are causing us to become uh, to behave uh, irrationally mm -hmm. towards other countries, and uh, this is all one planet, and people forget that. I think and, uh, we have to get we have to get a solution uh, before. The, this kind of war spreads. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what we were discussing earlier is that our behavior doesn't encourage the, it doesn't entirely encourage the moderates. Happened again recently in Iran. Uh, last week they had parliamentary elections where the conservatives won an overwhelming majority of the parliament seats. I think near seventy percent. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there's about two hundred nine seats in parliament, and they won a huge chunk of them. Um, which everybody is saying, based on the briefs that I'm reading. Um, and a great place to get information, just so you know, is NIACOUNCIL.ORG. It's N-I-A-C-O-U-N-C-I-L.ORG. And NIAC um, stands for the National Iranian American Council. And they're just basically an advocacy group, uh, nonpartisan, non-religious, non-whatever, <laughs> that works on Iranian American issues. Um, uh, all the religious minorities are, uh, based on their population, guaranteed a certain Some number seats. of seats in parliament. So. Barring those, the basically the Muslim candidates representing 80, 90 percent of the population, um, you know, they have there's a level of a religious test that they have to go through. The details of it, nobody knows. Again, this committee decides. So a good number of the reformist candidates were barred, which led to a lot of people to boycott the election. And if the economy, this is what I've heard, if the economy does not turn around in Iran, uh, he may be on the way out. I mean, it's, 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 it's well, I mean, it's, it's, it's about, again, it's about economic policy and, you know, uh, 
George Bush's legacy, you know, he, he was fairly popular even with the Iraq War until the economy started going south and the gas prices started going up to three dollars a gallon, and that's that's when his numbers really started to tank. It's, and it's all about people wanting to do better than they did. They they want to be able to say, "My president has given me this," mm -hmm. and instead, you know, they can't say that either exactly. in Iran or here. And they're uncanny. It's <laughs> it's really strange how similar they are. I, yeah. mean, I mean, I know they're very different in their own rights, but they're very similar individuals. It's really interesting and eerie how similar both of these people. No, but you made a good point. I mean, it's during these times of conflict when you lose the middle class. I mean, the middle class is a, is a really important part of maintaining civil society, maintaining that level of accountability towards a government and promoting a democratic society. So when you don't have the middle class, not only is that a problem, but when your middle class leaves, when they emigrate and take so much of the national wealth with them, then what happens to the country? Uh, we had, you know, Hillary Clinton voted for Lieberman Kyle, which if you're not familiar with that bill, was to declare the Iranian Guard uh, a terrorist organization, which is basically like for instance, if the Soviet Union was to declare the Marines a terrorist organization, it's basically like saying that the state-sponsored military wing, which is, you know, for purposes of defense, is terrorist, is is ludicrous. And uh, McCain is out there with Joe Lieberman. Both are talking about the terrorist activity in Iran, and you know, I'm tired of it. You know, I, I want to see us go in a different direction because, you know. Whether there are some terrorist elements in other parts of the country or not, uh, starting out the conversation by not talking about <laughs> the diplomatic route, but automatically going towards the terror, you know, talking about terrorists, you know, it's, it signals that you're not willing to change the, the path of the country. And right now, we're already in a, a war in Iraq and Afghanistan that seem to be intractable. So we need to change course in some perspective. And we're back here with Ultimate Politics, UP News, Mile High Sports Radio, 1510 and 1570 AM. And my guest is, today has been Nagin Sabani, and she is with, she is a graduate of the International Studies Program at BU and has worked with the UN and Iran, and uh, just been a great uh, resource on discussing our relations in the United States with Iran and, and, and some possible solutions in the future for the diplomatic uh, and peaceful resolution of this event some issues that seem to be overstated by some people running for president, uh, or one person running for president. Um, what was that uh, that that website that you mentioned about, as far as information on Iranian issues? It's for the National Iranian American Council. Their website is niacouncil.org. org. It's like NIAC Council. <laughs> you only have one C in that. Um, but they're just a great source. Um, if you want, you can sign up for their email list. But they just basically work as advocates on issues facing Iranian Americans um, at the societal level and at the congressional level. So they have a lot of uh, close relationships, and they work on you know combating some of these issues. Not like I said, they're nonpartisan, so they don't support or they're not against the Iranian regime. They're just working on behalf of Iranian Americans here. They just have a lot of great information even to look up statistics, just see what's going on, especially if anybody's in the D.C. area. <laughs> I uh, I just was in D.C. Uh, last weekend. And, you know, I, I hope the change will come to D.C. and, and some leadership there. Um, one thing that, just as a side for you uh, ski fans, I was looking at some uh, some web pictures of Iran, and they have some beautiful ski resorts there, right? Some people are surprised. Iran is not desert. Uh, Iran has all climates that you could think of from the capital Tehran, which is about a mile high, just like Denver, surrounded by mountains, just like Denver. You drive about an hour north, you're in the mountains, you can go skiing. You drive another two hours, you're in the tropical climate of the Caspian Sea. So, and then the south, you have tropics, and you have some desert, but uh, the majority of the country is not desert. <laughs> and for you folks out there, uh, if you can, look up online a picture of Tehran, and it looks a lot like Denver. Thanks for being on the show, Nikki. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's been a real nice uh, time seeing you, and we'll have you back on when we're talking with Africa Today Associates and talking about some of the issues going on in Darfur, which we do. And you can email me at wade at ultimatepolitics.net. And this is 1510 and 1570 Mile High Sports Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.